Family Theater presents Jane Powell and Parley Bear. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Parley Bear as old Judge Priest in Quality Folks by Irvin S. Cobb. To introduce the drama, your hostess, Jane Powell. Oh, thank you very much, Jean Baker. A few weeks ago, Family Theater presented one of Irvin S. Cobb's favorite characters, Old Judge Priest. The reaction of our audience was so gratifying, and the number of requests for another story so numerous, that we are happy to reintroduce Old Judge Priest to you again. It is with a great deal of pleasure, and with a deep bow to you for your letters, that we bring you Parley Bear as Judge William Pittman Priest, and Ruby Dandridge as Aunt Charlie in Irvin S. Cobb's Quality Folks. <laughs> Judge Priest, as was his custom, had allowed his considerable bulk to settle down in an old leather rocker on his front porch on Clay Street. He started out of his drowse as he heard the latch on the front gate give and the hinges sag open. He brushed a hand across his eyes and smiled happily. One of his cronies was coming through the gate after nearly three years sojourn in Florida. And to old men, three years is a long, long time. Well, Lou Lake, I do declare I am glad to see you. <laughs> well, Judge, it's sure good to see you. When did you get back, son? Just last night, Billy. I would have come over then, but it was late when that old train puffed in. Three whole years you've been gone, ain't it, Lou? Yes, sir, three years. <laughs> I've missed you, son. I ain't had a decent game of croquet since you left. I declare I am glad to see you. And I, you, Billy. A uh, considerable number of things have happened in three years, I take it. You grab a seat on the swing there, Lou, and rest your hands and feet. Yep, yeah, I don't mind if I do. I don't mind if I do. I've been expecting you to come banging back here, but I had to do what I did. I had to act on my own judgment, seeing as you was nowhere's about. I uh, got an announcement, Billy. A born an announcement. Yep. A born an announcement. Yeah, I suspicion that's what brought you hightailing. A thing like that's never happened before, Judge. Not down here in the South, particularly. Yeah, or anywhere else, neither, as far as I can recollect. But that ain't no reason why it shouldn't. But Emmy Lou, Billy, our own personal no, no, war. No, no, hold on, Lou, hold on. Lots of folks is bearing the names they are because somebody else had them first. Take Wadsworth Jr.'s Courtney Esquire, attorney at law, for instance. His... Boy and general factotum who sweeps out the office for him. His name's Wadsworth Junior's Courtney Jones. Well, that's only natural, Billy. His mammy named him that with special intent to do honor to her right indulgent employer. Yes, and you recollect Rowena Hildegard Tellingham. Twelve months after her christening, there was four more Rowena Hildegards in our fair city. I know, Billy, but that's common occurrence with our people. But you'll have to admit this is the first time a white baby's been dubbed with the name of her mammy. And with due knowledge of the fact and with deliberate intent. Yeah, no, that ain't so bad, is it, Lou? Well, it seems to me in your official capacity you could have prevented it. Well, I reckon I could have. Had I had the desire. Then maybe I couldn't either. Now, look, Lou, maybe you better hear the whole story right from the onset. <laughs> Well, Lou, it all started about two years ago. For more years than either you or me cares to remember, there's been certain people known for certain things in this town. Mainmost among them has been old Aunt Charlotte Helm and the loudest, most discordant voice in our town. And it was that foghorn voice going full blast one hot afternoon that sort of started bringing matters to a head. You've seen her yourself, Lou, gallivanting back and forth from the Dabney house to the store, wearing a spotless white cloth around her head and a man's battered straw hat teetering jauntily on top of it. <laughs> 
is home. Well, but in spite of whooping it up in a voice that could crack a window, everything about her, her gait despite its limp, her pose, her figure, there was something masterful, something dominating, something tremendously proud, Lou. Slowly she crossed the yard and let herself out the side gate. She went out of sight and, strangely enough, even out of hearing down the side street in the hot sunshine of the late afternoon. The well-dressed young man, feeling a good bit of relief, settled back in the hammock he was stretched out in behind the thick screen of vines that covered the wide front porch of the Dabney house. The uh, estimable Aunt Charlotte appears to be in excellent voice and spirits today, Miss Amy Lou. It's perfectly awful. I know it. I don't know that I ever heard her when her top notes carried farther than they did just now. If Mildred and I have asked her once not to carry on like that here at the front of the house, we've asked her a hundred times. <laughs> it's bad enough to have her whooping like a wild Indian in the kitchen. But it never seems to do any good. Well, uh, why don't you try getting rid of her altogether as a remedy? Get rid of Aunt Charlie? Why, Harvey? Mr. Winslow, we couldn't do that. Why not? Why, Aunt Charlie's always been in our family. Why, she's just like one of us. Just like our own flesh and blood. Why, she used to belong to my grandmother, Helm, before the Great War. Why... I see. She used to belong to your grandmother, and now you belong to her. Uh, tell me, Miss Amy Lowe, how does it feel to be a human chattel with no prospect of emancipation? Why, Mr. Winslow, <laughs> don't... <laughs> Never mind. You're the sweetest little old slave girl I've ever met. <laughs> Mr. Winslow. And uh, besides, she's gone. Won't be back for a half hour or so. Well, now, uh, don't hit your chair away from me. I've got something very important that I want to tell you. It concerns you and somebody else. It concerns me and somebody else. And yet only two persons are concerned in it. Time has a way of fleeting when two young people are in love. And it didn't seem like no time at all to Emmy Lou and young Mr. Winslow till... I'm back! Yes, Aunt Charlie, we know. Huh. Your hand stopped aching? Why? Uh, <clears throat> seems like Mr. Winslow rubbing it right smart. Quality folks just don't do that. Uh, make her go away, Miss Emmy Lou. I'll try. Is... Is that you, Aunt Charlie? Who else you suppose it is? Well, hadn't you better be seeing about supper? Now, never you mind about supper. I'm tending to the supper. I bet the supper be ready for you two babies ready to eat it. You see how it is? And he's so set in her ways. Yeah, she's set in that rocking chair, too. Emmy Lou, please try again. Go in yourself and speak to her. This is your house, isn't it? Yours and your sister's. Oh, of course, Harvey. But... I thought Southerners could handle their servants. So if you can handle this one, suppose you give me proof of the fact right now. Well, I'll try. I'll try. Aunt Charlie, won't you please? Now, Miss Emma Lou, you might just as well hush up and save your breath. Because you know and I know, even if he don't know it, that it ain't proper for no young man to be coating no young lady right out on the front porch without no chaperone being close by. Quality folks just don't do such as that. But we aren't doing anything. That's just why I taken my foot in my hand and come hurrying back from that grocery store when I saw your sister drinking ice cream soda with a lot of young folks in Mr. B. Wiley's candy store. And by that, I realized that I'd left you alone in this house with a young man as a stranger here. But do you have to sit right here? Here I am, honey, and here I stay. But Aunt Charlie, <laughs> Mr. Winslow objects. He... Oh, he does, does he? Well, just let him object. That's his privilege. Just let him keep on objecting. Can't go influence me none. Shh, Aunt Charlie, Mr. Winslow will hear you. I don't care if he do hear me. Maybe it might do him some good if he hears me. It'll do him good, too, if he heeds me. I'll lay to that. Please, Aunt Charlie. No sorry, honey. I ain't gonna stir near an inch from here until your sister gets back here. Now run along back out there and learn that young man from the north some manners as we see them.
Did... Did you hear what she said, Harvey? I imagine the people in the next block heard it, too. She just can't seem to understand that Mildred and I have grown up. She still wants to boss us just as she did when we were children. Yes, and I, a poor benighted Yankee that I am, came down here with a great and burning sympathy for the poor downtrodden Southerners. I know she loves us with every drop of blood in her veins. Why, she'd work her fingers to the bone for us. Why, she'd die in her tracks fighting for us. We try to remember that now that she's old and fussy and unreasonable and all crippled up with rheumatism. Well, yes, you, you do have a problem. But it's almost unbearable to have her playing the noisy old tyrant day in and day out. I get awful out of patience with her. But, you know, Harvey, in spite of everything, I think Annie likes you. Mill. What are you in the dumps about? Oh, it's Aunt Charlie again. Honestly, Mill, she was absolutely unbearable this evening. I don't know what sort of people her... Mr. Winslow thinks we must be. I know. You should have heard what she said to me down at Wheels Ice Cream Parlor. Oh, it must have been just perfectly, awfully horrible for you too, Em. It was. And she gets worse all the time. Quality folks, quality folks. She's always preaching about our being quality folks. I'm sick and tired of the words. And I'm not going to stand for it. Does she think we're still babies? Why should we be so... Supper's mad? ready. You children come right in. Eat it while it's hot. Yes, Aunt Charlie. Aunt Charlie. Huh. Seems like the cat's got everybody's tongue around this place. Well, ain't no use for nobody to be pouting and sullen. Ain't gonna do them no good. Ain't gonna budge me nary hair's breath from what I consider my plain duty. If folks don't like it, so much the worse for them. Present company not accepted. There. That's my saying. I done said it. That night, Emmy Lou and Mildred sat in their nightgowns on the side of Emmy Lou's bed and tried the case of spinster Charlotte Helm colored in the scales of their own youthful judgments. Oh, dear. There are so many, many fine things to say for a male. Mm -hmm. If she'd only let us get her some help for around the house. But she won't. Or if we could only get her to go and live in that little house that Father left her in his will. She won't do that either. Well, we've been growing up. Aunt Charlie's been growing old. <laughs> Remember, Mill, when Aunt Charlie dressed us for our first party? <laughs> our first real party. <laughs> and, and remember how she skimped and scrimped to run the house after Mother died? Mm. When Father's investment sighed on us? Yes, I do. And it's a good thing they turned out all right in the long run. And how she insisted we go to the same school that Mother had attended. Even though we wanted to go to an Eastern school. We would have, too, if Judge Priest and Lou Lake hadn't sided in with her. And remember when... It was on a certain moonlit, fragrant night not long after this that... Two happy young people agreed that thereafter these twain should be one. In obedience to a feeling that told her Aunt Charlie she'd be the first, next only to her own sister, to share with her the happiness that had come into her life, Emmy Lou sought out the old woman just before breakfast time. Isn't it just too, too wonderful, Aunt Charlie? Huh? You children too young to know your own mind. Now you like Harvey. You know you do. Flying off with the first young gentleman that come along from nobody knows what. But Lou at prayer meeting on Wednesday night at the Zion Colored Baptist Church And Charlie belied her muttered complaints with an air of triumphant haughtiness Which sorely irked her fellow members But if young Mr. Winslow had been the cause of her prideful deportment before her own people it was likewise Mr. Winslow who was shortly to be the instrument for humbling old Aunt Charlie into the very dust. 
It was a stand he took with regard to the future status of Aunt Charlie in the household of which he was to become a member and of which he meant to be the head. Emmy Lou took her sister with her on the afternoon she invaded the kitchen to break the news. Andy, we've... I have something I want to say to you. I'm listening, child. Well, it's this way, Andy. We think... I mean, we're afraid you're getting along so in life, getting so old... Who says I'm getting old? We both think so. Oh, I mean, we all think so. Who do you mean by we all? You mean that young Mr. Winslow, Esquire, late of the North? Well... Uh Uh-huh. I might have known he'd be the very one to come putting such notions of them in you children's heads. Well, ma'am, and what prayer do he want? He thinks, in fact, we all three do, that because you are getting along in years, you know you are, Auntie, that, well, perhaps we should make a change in the running of the house, so... So So what? (laughs) Now, see here. If you're fixing to bring up the subject of I'm letting every one of these young flighty-headed, flippity gibbity gals come work on this place, you might as well save your breath now and hereafter. Because as long as I'm able to drag one foot behind the other, I'm pining the dust aim to manage this here kitchen. Well, it isn't that. Exactly, Andy. You see, after we're married, Harvey and I are going to live here. And Mildred, too. And with one more coming into the household and everything... The added work will be too heavy for you to undertake. And, uh... Oh, and child said whatever it is. So, we decided that perhaps it would be better if you left here altogether and went to live in that nice little house that Papa left you in his will. Do it all mean, then, that after all these years, you trying to get shed of me? Trying to throw me aside like an old worn-out broom? Well, I ain't where to go! <laughs> Your, your wages will go on just the same. Harvey insists on that just as much as we do. Your life will be so much easier. You can come and see us, and we'll come and see you every day if you want us to. It isn't as if you were going clean out of our lives. You'll be ever so much happier. You can work in your little garden and... Well, I ain't gonna go. Not nary step. Think I'm gonna sit quiet while I'm pulled up by the roots and... Transported where from the house where I spent putting out a hole in my in-doing life? Well, I won't go. I won't never go. I won't go, case I just can't. Well, Lou, it wasn't the Aunt Charlie they knew or we would have known who waited on them that night at supper. Rather, it was her ghost. A ghost with a dusky mask of tragedy for her face. Wasn't until after they'd risen from their places that Aunt Charlie spoke to him across the threshold of the door at the back of their dining room. You know nobody else can't turn me out of this house. And if you do, I'm going to camp right there on the sidewalk. And there I mean to stay till the policeman takes me for Vegas. The shame of it won't be no greater for me than just for you. That's all. That's just about the story, Lou. Being as the rest of it happened mighty fast, I guess it wasn't more than a week after that that Emmy Lou come to see me herself. May I come in, Judge Priest? Well, hello, honey. You slipped in so quiet on them dainty little feet of yours, never heard you coming at all. Sit down in that chair under there where I can look at you whilst we visit. I'd rather sit here on the sofa beside you if you don't mind. Well, shoot yourself, honey. It... It's about Aunt Charlie, Judge Priest. It is, huh? Well, I had a visit from her here the other day. What other day? Oh, must have been a matter of three weeks ago. She wanted to know what I knowed about this here young Yankee, Mr. Winslow. Wanted to know if he was the kind of man fitting to be getting himself engaged to a member of the Dabney family. Wanted to know if he was quality folks. She... She did? Of course, I was able to reassure her child, having took the responsibility of doing a little inquiring around about that young man myself. Oh, Judge Priest. Of course, we both know, you and me, what was in the back of Aunt Charlie's old kinky head. When I got done telling her, 
She went down the street from here singing till you could have heard her a mile off, I reckon. I never guessed it. I know now better than ever how much she really loves me. And it's going to make it all harder for me to... to... Suppose you just start at the beginning, honey, and give me all the facts in the matter. All right, Judge Priest. But you must believe me. We aren't ungrateful for everything she's done. It's only that she's old now. And I don't know what to do. Aunt Charlie won't budge an inch, Judge Priest, and Harvey won't budge an inch. Oh, what am I going to do? Here, here, here. here, here here's my kerchief, honey. Now, now, tell me one thing, Amy Lou, just to satisfy my own curiosity. You met this young man of yours whilst you and little Mildred were off at Knollwood Seminary. Is that so, or ain't it? Why, yes, sir. That's true. Well, child, what would you say, or more important, what would you do if I was to tell you that if it hadn't been for old Aunt Charlie, you never would have known Mr. Harvey Winslow in the first place? Why, Judge Priest... How could that be? Emmy Lou, in telling you what I'm going to tell you, I'm breaking a solemn pledge. And that's a thing that I ain't much given to doing. Yes, Judge. You remember how in the first few years following the time your mother left us, the estate was sort of snarled up? Vaguely, Judge. Well, it was snarled up a lot worse than you children had any idea of. It was only by Aunt Charlotte's careful management that you was even able to eat decent. Why, I, I never knew things was that bad. Well, just about that time Aunt Charlie come to see me in Lou Lake, and she told us that you children had grown up with the idea that you'd go off to boarding school somewhere. But, Judge, now, let, we... let me let me finish. Of course, we had to tell her just how things stood, that there wasn't enough money and that you couldn't go. Well, I reckon you can guess for yourself what that old woman done then. She just reared right up and showed all her teeth. But, Judge, we went to the school for two whole years. If what you say is true, Your I... Aunt Shirley was right, Emmy Lou, when she told you that she couldn't leave your household. That she can't go to live in that little house your father left her. Because it ain't hers no more. Over five years ago, she sold it outright. She took the money she got for it, Added to it what she'd saved up as the fruits of a lifetime of toil spent in your service and the service of your people before you. That was the money. Her money. Every cent of it which paid for your two years at college. Well, now you know. Aunt Charlie will skin me alive most like for telling, too. Oh, I never dreamed. Why did you and Dr. Lake ever let her do it? Well, honey, we did try to discourage her from the notion, but pretty soon we seen it just wasn't no use to try. And then somehow we didn't want to try, because there's some impulses in this world that's too noble to be interfered with or hampered. Judge, you may have kept this a secret for all these years, but it isn't going to be a secret any longer. Everybody in this whole town is going to know because I'm going to tell them. And Aunt Charlie stays. What do you suppose your young man from the North's going to have to say about that? If he doesn't like it, he can find some other girl to marry him. <laughs> And who gives this young woman to this young man in holy matrimony? I do, Parson. I do. And cause why? Cause there's quality folks, Parson. Both of them. Glory be to heaven. Yep, will you? Fella gets out of touch when he's been away for three years. Yep, out of touch. Now, about that that morning announcement that sent you hightailing way back up here from Florida, Lou. Oh, yes, it's a mighty interesting document. Then I suppose you already got one. I made the arrangements for having it printed, son. Yep. 
Mr. and Mrs. Harvey Winslow take pleasure in announcing the birth of a daughter, Charlotte Helm Winslow, born June 19, 1905. And do you know something, Lou? Already folks is beginning to call that little pink mite Little Charlotte. And you know something else? It was Mr. Harvey Winslow, late of the North, who suggested that name. <laughs> tonight's play were quality folks. They were trying to do something for each other to make life a little happier for those around them. And we know what a difference that kind of attitude can make in a home, in a family. If in your home you're trying to put yourself out to do little things for mother, father, for brother or sister, your family must have a spirit of happiness and contentment. This is what everyone wants in their family. And we know that you will learn, as thousands of other families have learned, that this spirit of helping each other, of working together, is strengthened by the practice of daily family prayer. So we remind you, as we do each week, that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater is brought to you Parley Bear as old Judge Priest in Irvin S. Cobb's classic, Quality Folks, with Jane Powell as your hostess and Ruby Dandridge as Aunt Charlotte. Others in our cast were Fred Howard, High Aberback, Virginia Gregg, and Eve McVeigh. This adaptation of Irvin Cobb's familiar work was written by Fred Howard, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. Our Family Theater broadcasts are made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Gene Baker expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home, and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Arlene Dahl and Robert Stack in The Spy by James Fenimore Cooper. Join us, won't you? (laughs) Family Theatre is heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, is broadcast to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service, and is released in the Philippines by the Philippine Radio Corporation. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System.